topics. So we are going to talk about the story of credit and how to take care of your debt. Um, but understand that credit is always borrowing from somebody else and the terms in which we pay them back. I love this quote from Charles Dickens because it does explain how credit was used, say prior to the bank meltdown, I should say. So um, if you guys remember the bank meltdown in 2009, um, basically what happens was the bank was extended more money than they had in their vaults. So Charles was very right where credit was a system whereby a person who can't pay got another person who couldn't pay to guarantee that he could pay. And um, credit has evolved since then. We're going to go over some of the changes that did happen. Um, we're going to go over that beautiful credit report that we're always talking about. And we're going to talk about how to manage that debt that we create in our lives um, and to mitigate it as much as possible. So what do you do with your money? Obviously, we have to think about all the different tools that we have to watch out for our finances. We need to think about creating that budget, um, having the discipline to accomplish whatever goals that we've set, um, and moving forward with our SMART goals and the budget. So when we talk about credit, there are different types of credit that we use out there. Um, whether it's revolving, installment, or different things, they all have a different effect on our credit report. Revolving credit is the biggest driver to your credit score. Revolving credit can be anything from a charge card or a credit card to overdraft protection on your checking account. It could be a line of credit to start a business, or it could be a home equity loan. But any type of revolving credit has a set limit that you can borrow up to. And dependent on how much you borrow pay back, it leaves an available amount. And that becomes a driver for the score because we always want to have a cushion on the score. Revolving credit also does not end unless one of three things happens. Either you close your account, which we do not suggest people do, if they've had long-standing accounts. Um, the second way is if you don't use it for a while, one of the ways that the banks are cleaning up their balance sheets is they will close it for lack of usage. The third, obviously, is if you mess up, they're going to send you to collections and close your account. So again, revolving credit is our biggest driver. Installment credit is important as well, but it does not have that history or the open usage of revolving credit. Installment credit would be all your loans, whether it's a mortgage, a car loan, personal loan, student loans, things like that. They have a start date and an end. And as you make your payments, you're doing great on your credit report, but the amount of available credit goes down with each payment. And when it's done, it's done. If you do not have anything open in good standing on your credit report after a installment credit or loan closes, your credit score is going to start dropping and it's going to move away from your credit report. So when people are looking at your credit report, they're looking at what's going on right now the most. Good things will last on that credit report for 10 or more years. Bad things in general fall off after seven years from the last transaction. So if you only have loans on your credit report, after they're paid in full that very next month, there's nothing coming into the history. There's nothing being recorded. And that's why it has such an effect. Whereas the revolving credit, you still have your credit available, whether you're using it or not, 
as long as you use it every so often. Non-installment credit, I always tease people that it's Popeye's friend Wimpy. I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Non-installment credit obviously usually does not show up on your credit report. It's a tab. And prior to 1953, there were no credit cards. If you did not have the money to pay for your groceries or the drugstore or whatever, you would hope the merchant would open up a tab for you. And as long as you paid them by your next paycheck, you were all good. If you didn't pay them, guess what? You were shut down from getting goods and services. So down south, there are still places that do tabs. Up north, not so much. But it's important to understand that that is a type of credit. Service credit, however, is another type of credit. Obviously, it's cell phones and cable and utilities and things like that. From the picture, you can tell that. Um, but service credit is the type of credit that does not show up on your credit report unless you're in collections. So this is the easiest to keep out of collections. And I do lump in along with service credit, medical debt. Because if you get behind with either type of credit, as long as you aren't 120 days past due, both your utility companies and with medical debt will do payment agreements with you. So say I'm behind a month or two with my cell phone. If I can catch up in the month I'm in, they're going to do a payment arrangement with me to catch me up on any arrearages. With medical debt, I always tell people, you're the CEO of your own corporation. Believe it or not, you hired your insurance company, even though maybe you didn't pick it. You hired it, and you hired your doctor, hospital, ambulance service, or whatever. If there is an issue with the coding on your statements, and the insurance company and the hospital are not talking, who's responsible for fixing it? You are. So I always tell people, get into a small payment agreement while you're fixing the issues. Five or $10 a month is enough to keep it out of collections. When the issue is corrected, guess what? You can get reimbursed that money. And in fact, this scenario happened to me um, when I moved from Mass to New Hampshire. I switched doctor's offices. I did call my insurance company and notify them, but somehow somebody didn't data enter something. When I went to my doctors, saw them, they put in for the insurance to cover it. And there was a glitch on coding. I found out about it. I started paying my doctor's office $5 a month while I got that fixed. And when it got fixed, I got a reimbursement check of $20. Nice and easy to keep something like this out of collections. Again, you are responsible. So you do have to watch what's going on. High-risk credit are things that we want you to stay away from. High-risk credit could be anything from payday loans, which are illegal in Massachusetts, to check cashers, to rent a center, and many, many others. Learn to read contracts. That's my big warning to you. If it sounds too good to be true, no credit, no hassle, run in the other direction because you know there's a glitch. High interest credit is high risk credit, all right? There are many ways to find things more affordable and do things at a better rate. So let's think about this. I put a $200 TV on layaway at Walmart. I pay 25 bucks a week and I get to bring the TV home in two months. Not bad. I go to Best Buy. I will pay two to three times the retail value by the time I'm done paying for that TV. Even though I got to bring it home and use it, it wasn't worth the extra expense. I go to 
I'm sorry, I meant rent a center. I go to Best Buy and it's 0% interest for six months from the date of purchase. So that means I have to pay it off in five billing statements because they don't bill you the day you buy it. All right. As long as you understand that and you've got the capacity in your budget to make those payments, you get to bring it home and use it while you're paying for it and have no interest payments. That is the deal. But you need to understand that contract. Now, a long time ago, I ended up having an issue where I had my car in um, an auto shop. I thought I was getting a new muffler. I saw the mechanic, he was plastering a Coke can on my muffler. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he said, Sue, not driving this car anymore. Your entire frame is rusted out. Call your buddy at the auto dealership and see if they've got something to trade in for. So I did call my friend and he did have something that had just been traded in. And he said that they give it to me for the price that they paid for it. You know, just get down there. He'd do all the paperwork. So as I was driving, I was very nervous that my tires were going to fall out from underneath me. And I got to the dealership. They had the paperwork all done. But the interest rate on their loan was like 13%. And I looked at my friend and I said, my bank will give me, you know, 47 and he goes, no problem, go to your bank. We'll rework the paperwork, bring the check back and you can drive away with that. And I was so nervous about driving the vehicle. I did not read any further in that contract. I said, you know what, I'm just gonna do it. I'll switch over the note to my bank next month. Next month came, I went with the cashier's check from my bank over to the bank that was holding the note, had the interest figured out, everything was calculated, handed it over and asked for my title. Well, the guy said, you owe us more money. And I said, my bank calculated the interest for me, made sure that we were right. And he goes, nope, there's an early termination fee on the contract, you owe us $500 more. Again, I did not fully read the contract. If you don't understand a contract or it sounds too good to be true, bring it to somebody else that you know that you can hash through it with. And that way you can read the fine print and understand what you're signing. Sometimes those contracts can work in your favor like the Best Buy one. If you understand the terms and conditions, sometimes they can bite you in the butt. When we're thinking about credit, we also have to think about the C's to credit, all right? We already talked about capacity, the capacity to pay back. We find that from our budget, knowing that we have the money to pay back anything that we owe. Capital is very important to it too. Capital is the cash that you have to put down. On bigger ticket items, capital, not only can lower the amount that you're paying over time because you're putting more skin in the game, it can also lower the interest rates on bigger ticket items, cars, homes, things like that. Collateral would be something that you're putting up against a loan. So that would be the car against the car loan, the home against the mortgage. For somebody that is first starting off with credit, or is trying to clean up bad things from the past or has no credit whatsoever. What I usually tell them to do is to get a secured credit card through a local credit union. The reason I like local credit unions for secured credit cards are twofold. Number one, there are no fees. Number two, is if you needed to carry a balance, which I do not recommend, but if you need to carry a balance, their interest rates are much lower than the big banks. For a secured credit card, what the bank will do 
is they will open up a certificate of deposit for you. Your money goes into the certificate of deposit, your collateral. You will gain interest while it's sitting in that account, depending on the terms of the contract. It could be a year, USAA, it's two years. They are not going to touch that money unless you totally default on the credit card. The bank issues the credit card for the same amount of money or approximately. You use it for small things that are normally in your budget and pay it off in full when the statement comes in. I've seen people that didn't have any credit have a decent credit score within six months to a year. I've seen people offset bad things from their past very quickly using secured credit. But the thing is to use it lightly, okay? We don't ever want to go over 30% usage. And like I said, I prefer you being able to pay it off in full as soon as the statement comes in. Reason for this, after the meltdown of the banks and 9-11, laws changed. Credit card companies must send you your billing statement 14 days prior to it being due. And they cannot start charging interest till 28 days after the purchase date. So if you paid in full as soon as you get your statement in, guess what? You're not paying a dime of interest. So now we're starting to use credit to our benefit rather than the creditor's benefit. And I like that one. And I'll give you an example of this. I shop at Kohl's. And I budget usually about $200 a year towards my clothes buying. And I put it away because I don't buy clothes every single month out of the year. I tend to buy seasonally. When I go to Kohl's, I know how much I can spend. And I've made interest on that money because it's sitting in a savings account, not my checking account, until I do my shopping. I use the Kohl's credit card, even though it says 21.99% interest on the front, which most big banks or credit cards that belong to store cards are out of Delaware and Nevada, where they can charge up to 36% for an active service member or 39.99 for a default on a regular citizen. They tend to have higher interest rates. But I use it because I get an extra 15, 20, 30% off of what I buy if I use the credit card. And then I get the Kohl's box so I can go back for that one item that, you know, I didn't want to pay full price for. When the statement comes in, I pay it off in full. So now I've gotten a five-way win doing my clothes shopping. I've maximized my use of my credit to my benefit, not somebody else's. Conditions speak to the marketplace. It speaks to the economy. As you notice, prices are going up right now, but the interest rates haven't started to click back in on your savings. Um, you're going to see some changes. Interest rates will go back up over the next year, um, but we are looking at more inflation. So as conditions in the marketplace change, obviously that affects our buying power. It can also affect the interest rates on your credit cards. So being very cautious on your use of credit right now is smart. Okay, and we don't really have much say with conditions when things even out, you know, conditions might get better. We have to see. And usually things do change with each administration that comes in for the good or the bad or in between. But we do have something to say about the last seat of credit, and that's character. That's who you are, your morals, your values, your trustworthiness. And this is what everybody's looking at. And when they're looking at a credit report, it's not like the olden days 
where when I lived in Framingham, I could go down to Framingham Savings Bank. Yeah, I'm talking way back when. And I could see the banker and tell him, you know, my truck just died. You know, I need to get a new transmission and I need to borrow the money to do it. And the banker can make that decision. Well, he's been taken out of the decision making because they're not allowed to discriminate against race, color, creed, religion, sexuality, or anything else. So now the banker takes in your application and the bank gets a copy of your credit report. And this information goes up to a team of underwriters. And I'd say in about 95, 97% of banks, the underwriters now are basically data entry clerks. They're entering this information into a computer that is calculated to the risk factors of that particular bank. Very few banks allow the underwriting team to add into it. So with the credit report itself, there are three credit reporting agencies, TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. And they all calculate out your credit, and we will go through that in a minute, um, based on the information that is sent to them, which is how much debt does Sue have? How much available credit does Sue have? Uh, how long has Sue lived in her house? How long has Sue been with her job? Maybe, maybe they have that information. How many times have Sue looking for new money in the past two years? That's all information they have. Your bank knows your income. Your bank knows your spending habits, not the credit reporting agencies. And they all calculate this out using Fair Isaac Credit Systems or FICO score or Vantage score, which is run basically the same way as a FICO score is, all right? And they're all for profit businesses. So if we think about it, if we all have bakeries in the same town and we all sold chocolate chip cookies, are we all gonna use the same recipes? No, we're gonna tweak it a little bit. It's basically the same, but little tweaks here and there. I'm gonna use the dark chocolate because I think it'll sell more cookies. Somebody else might use white chocolate or macadamia nuts, whatever. We all wanna sell more. Well, when you go to the bank or you go to a credit card company or you go to another place looking to borrow money, they all have their own idea of what risk and trust is. So by getting the credit report that might be a little bit different from all three, it's okay because they're also going to be calculating your income and everything else over here to determine what their risk factors are for you. So when we talk about credit reports and credit scores, I really don't have people, you know, being in on the number. A FICO score can go anywhere from 300 to 850. 850 being the best, and I've never seen somebody with a perfect score. But if you're looking to get a job, get an apartment, you know, borrow money for a car or a home or whatever it may be, guess what? You need something good and solid on that credit report. So we do have to think about what's going into that number in order to get all our, you know, insurance and decisions made. And I bring up insurance because one thing about Massachusetts, we're very lucky. Um, as of so far, knock on whatever, our credit report is not included in our car insurance for a risk factor. Most other states, they do include what's going on with your credit report because they deem you more likely to allow your car to be stolen or crack it up in order to collect the money to pay off debt, which I totally don't agree with. In Massachusetts, the um, car insurance companies go up to the state house every year trying to change the law. But so far, it sticks to the risk factors in your local community of car theft and things like that, and your driving record, 
which I think is a much more fair system. So going back to the other half of this, the three credit reporting agencies. If you need to get a copy of your credit report, which I do highly recommend, you should be going directly to one of the three credit reporting agencies or annualcreditreport.com. Now, you'll notice on the slide, it says you can get a free credit report from each one of the reporting agencies once a year for free through the FACT Act. An annual is put together through the FACT Act for real, for free. And also you can do disputes if you see something that's incorrect on your credit report while you're there right online and they will go back to the creditor and all three credit reporting agencies for you. The creditor will have 30 days to tell you why you owe the money or remove it from the credit report. I usually say paperwork always takes time. Double check it in 60 days. If it's not taken care of or they haven't told you why you owe the money, then you can ask for it to be removed per the FACT Act. Now, with that said, I really highly recommend not going to any app for a copy of your credit report. When you join an app, number one, remember I said you're the CEO of your own corporation. You got to read the fine print in contracts. Just like the Flashlight app, if you read the fine print in most of those contracts because you're getting it for free, they are asking you to allow them access to everything on your phone. And you're also giving them permission to sell whatever information they want about you to the third party. Now, I'm not saying somebody like Credit Karma is going to sell it to somebody nefarious, but you never know down the line who's selling what to who. So I always say stay away from all apps. Annual is through the federal government for real, for free. You will be able to get your credit report. The score will cost you a little bit to get if you choose to get the score, but by the time we're done with this class, you'll understand what goes into the score and know what to do to work on improving your credit. Now, due to COVID, you are entitled to get a copy of your credit report through April of 2022 on a weekly basis from each of the three credit reporting agencies and annualcreditreport.com because of the high risk to identity theft. But you can go on here. This is what the app, I'm um, sorry, the website looks like. And you'll see where it's circled. You get a copy of your free credit report. You're gonna answer that I wanna request my free credit report again. Go through some steps to prove that you're you and it will come up right on screen for you. And like I said, if you do have an issue with anything on there, you can dispute it right there and then. So let's think about scoring and building our credit stronger, all right? As I told you, and there has a correction on the screen as well, um, most scores are between 300 and 850. They all use basically the same scoring model. Some might add in how long you've been with your job or how long you've lived in your home but most of them are basically the same. The one that I do wanna correct is the Vantage score changed. It now looks identical to the classic FICO. So Vantage score, instead of being 501 to 990, is now 300 to 850, just so that you all know. So let's look at the score. It's broken down into a pie chart right here for you. Again, looking at your report, reading the report and understanding, all right, what's my payment history? Well, that's 35% of my score, whether I'm making a minimum payment or more than the minimum payment, as long as I'm paying on time, I've handled 35% of my score. So if I get past due, as soon as I catch up, I'm going to start adding points. Next 30%, speaks to that revolving credit I was talking so much about. 
how much available credit do I have versus what I'm using? If I'm always maxed out, guess what? I'm going to score low. If I'm using under 30%, I'm going to score much higher. Give you a prime example to this. So say we have a person that has had credit since the 80s. They always pay on time. They've got several types of credit and things are going well for them. But something happens in their life and they have to max out their credit. Their score is going to drop down to about a 660 to a 680, depending. Like I said, all three credit reporting agencies tweak a little bit, so within 20 points of each other. Now, if you were a veteran active duty service member, you could get a mortgage with a credit score like that. You're just shy of getting a first-time homebuyer loan. All right, they need a little higher score. But as you pay down debt, your score will go up. So at 50% usage, same scenario, you're going to score somewhere around a 730 to 750. Same scenario, under 30% usage, you're going to be over a 780, depending on how long you've had it and what types of credit you have. So as we pay down debt, our score naturally goes up. That is one of the most important things to know and to understand. Try not to use more than 30% of what's available to you. If you have debt higher th than that, let's start trying to work that debt down so our usage is lower. 15% of our score is that history and longevity, getting to know you. Believe it or not, somebody that has bad things in their past on their credit report, and it is a picture in time, so they're going to see ups and downs in your life, will get credit faster than somebody with no credit report. And you will have no credit report if you haven't had any credit available to you in the last 10 years. So, again, having that revolving credit can drive up the score because that's the one thing that's going to give us that longevity of history. New FICO 1010T, that's the latest scoring model of the FICO. They expect people to have something happen in their lives. Life happens to all of us. I always say that, and it's true. If you are one of those people that spikes say with the medical debt or something happened with your house or your family had an emergency, whatever it may be, but they see you trying to pay it down, you're going to score up to 20 points higher than somebody that is just shifting debt from one place to another. So that now fits into this pie chart somewhere between that 15% of length of credit history and the amount of, um, of available credit that you have. Types of credit really doesn't matter a whole lot. It's only a 10% bump, car loan versus a credit card versus whatever. But where it does count is you're going to need one or two good lines of credit in order to get a car without a car loan. If you're trying to buy a house, you're going to need for most mortgages three. That could be three credit cards. It could be overdraft protection and two credit cards. It could be a number of other things. The exception to this are rural housing development loans, the Mass One loan, VA home loan, and the Mass Operation Welcome Home loan. Those will allow you to use good rent checks that they can clearly see going in and out of your bank account, not money orders, um, in lieu of that third type of credit. The last 10%, even though it's small, it's only 10% again, is new credit or hard inquiries versus soft inquiries. This can add up. Now, a soft inquiry is an informational pull only, okay? Has no effect to your score. 
So that's you getting a copy of your credit report from annualcreditreport.com or directly from the credit reporting agency. It's you looking for a job or if you are looking for an apartment, most of those are going to be soft inquiries. Your bank even is available to look at your credit report every six months to determine if they're going to change the terms of your credit. It's done as a soft inquiry. All that junk mail that you get in the house, guess what? They already pulled your credit report as a soft inquiry. No effect to your score. But as soon as you say, yes, I want to borrow that money, then it becomes a hard inquiry. If you got junk mail in, as soon as you sign on that dotted line and send it back to them, they're going to pull another copy of your credit report. And it's going to cost you somewhere around five points. Now, you say five points, that's not a big deal. And if I get the credit, guess what? It's offset because now I've got more available to me. True. But if you're denied, five points is five points. And the more places that you go looking for credit, say it's Christmas time, we go to the mall. Remember I told you credit reporting agencies are behind a wall. They only can see who's looking for new money. They don't know if I'm accepted, denied, what's going on in my life or anything else. So I go to Sears and they make me an offer and I say, sure. And then I go to Filene's look for another credit card. Then I go into Zares. Then I go into Caldors. Then I go in and I keep going to shops. Guess what? The credit reporting agencies are getting more and more nervous. What's going on in Sue's life? Why is she looking for all this new money? Does she lose her job? Does she have another emergency going on? Is she a spendthrift? What's happening? Is she going to remember when to pay it? Is she going to be able to make the minimum payments? Because they don't know. That's why points add up. Rule of thumb, five or less hard inquiries in a two-year period of time. That's how long they'll last on the credit report. You will regain points after the first year, but the um, inquiry will stay on it for two years. Okay? So, exceptions to the rule. Big ticket items. If you are shopping around for a car, you can go to a car dealership and they can send it out to 13 different banks. All those banks will show up as inquiries on your credit report. But point-wise, you have two weeks to shop around. Maybe AAA, your local credit union, usually your best deals for interest rates. Just saying. But any inquiries made within that two-week period of time are going to be lumped point-wise as one. It'll be approximately 10 points, but it'll hit you once. Now, if you get the car, that's a big ticket item. Guess what? Your score is going to dip because you got more debt. But as you start making payments, it'll bounce right back up. Same thing for a home. Only a home, they allow you 45 days to shop around for that mortgage. Same scenario, it'll be approximately 15 points. They're doing a tri-pull, it's the biggest ticket item you will ever buy, all right? So again, the thing for us to do is clear up our credit report as much as we can before we do these big ticket item type stuff, all right? And as we pay things down, our score will naturally go up. So first thing I want everybody to do, okay, is to get a copy of your credit report. Verify the information on it. If there is something incorrect, you want to do your disputes, okay? If you're not doing it on annualcreditreport.com, this slide tells you the things that you would need. Submit photocopies of any documentation, send out your letters to all three credit reporting agencies, all that good stuff, um, and expect some correspondence within 30 days. But we also want to think about the dangers of credit trouble and taking care of the debt that we have. So we do need to create a budget so we know what we've got to work with. 
all right? Figure out by pulling the credit report who we owe, how much we owe, and what the interest rates are. Some people will say prioritizing debt would be going Susie Orman's way and pay the one with the highest interest rate down first while we're making minimum payments to the rest to owe the least amount of money over time. That's correct. But there are other ways to deal with it too. You've got Dave Ramsey's way, which he says pay all the minimum payments to them all and get rid of the little ones first and then use that money as a snowball effect towards the next biggest, the next biggest, the next business, biggest. Or we can look at our usage and say, you know what? I've got this extra money. I'm going to put an extra $50 here, there, 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 and bring down my usage to push my score up faster. Any of those three things will work. It's whatever will get you off your butt. Do it. If you are barely making ends meet, and you're trying to figure out what to do, I would start calling your creditors. There are a lot of people out there that will work with you, especially right now in COVID. So right now your student loans are gaining 0% interest. It's the prime time to pay them down because you're paying down principal only. When that ends, the interest rates are gonna come back. So if we can pay them down, now's the time to do it. But let's say you're having an issue paying the minimums on everything. If you have a car loan out there, sometimes the bank will take one or two payments and stick it on the back end of the loan for you. You'll owe a little bit more money over time, but it might be enough to clear you up so that you can get a handle on things. If you owe back child support, there are people at the child support division that will work with you. If you owe back taxes, the IRS does payment agreements. In fact, MassDOR, as of two years ago, started doing payment agreements as well. There are different ways that you might be able to mitigate your student loans and things like that by getting in the 10-year repayment program. If you work for a federal um, organization or a nonprofit or a state organization where you make 10 years of on-time payments um, calculated out. After that, the rest of your student loans are wiped clean or you're a 100% disabled veteran. With a doctor's note, you can get your student loans wiped clean. There are things like that. And then some of your creditors, credit card companies um, might have lower interest rates for you for a short period of time. If that works, fantastic. And I go through these things from the least effect to your score to the worst. The next one in line is that does not work is calling into a consumer credit counseling agency like the one I work for. Basically what happens when you call into an agency like ours, nonprofit, and I'll tell you the difference later, but um, is they will go through your budget with a fine tooth comb, looking for deals and different ways to save money. They'll pull a copy of your credit report as a soft inquiry, and they may do a um, comparison against what's called a debt management program. Now, if you have credit cards going into debt management program, they do have to be closed. But you could keep an emergency account or two out and work on them yourselves while you're paying off debt through the debt management program. Your interest rates go down to next to nothing, very low interest rates. In order for the banks to help you get out of debt within a three to five year period of time. And you'll still get your statements and watch your debt being paid down. Very different than debt settlement companies. Very different than those organizations that call themselves debt repair companies. Um, I recommend debt management for the people that need it. I do not recommend the other two. And if you call the CFPB, they won't recommend them either.
So debt repair companies throw everything up against the wall to see what sticks. I consider that fraud because they send the good with the bad. Um, and then they take your money, sit on it and walk away if they have cleaned anything off your credit report. Now, those things might come back on your credit report after the dispute is over. With a debt settlement company, I could help you write the same letter that they would write, but they hold on to your money and sit on it, make interest off of it, take their fees off of it, and wait till the creditor is about ready to bang down your door to take you to court in order to make a settlement offer. Usually, your creditors obviously will not make a settlement with you unless you're extremely far past due. Usually they'll take 30 cents or 50 cents on the dollar. They're going to want a lump sum payment though. Very rare have I seen them take two or three. You want to make sure you get a letter in writing from your creditor before any settlement because you want to make sure the wording is proper. And know a few points. Anything that's excused over $600, you will receive a 1099 and have to pay taxes on that money. But sometimes it's a lot less debt and it may be worth it for you. Also, a settled notation will last on your credit report for seven years. It will have the most effect on you in the first two. Remember, a settlement, you are breaking your contract. It acts very similarly to a bankruptcy because you're not paying off your creditors in full like you promised to. So it could hold you back from making big purchases for two years out. As you bring up your score, obviously more people will work with you. And the last one on the list is bankruptcy. Our forefathers put it in the constitution for a reason. They believed everybody deserved a second chance and they do. Life happens. Sometimes that's the only recourse that you have. But nowadays, there are two different types of bankruptcies. There's Chapter 7 and Chapter 13. Chapter 13 is a reorganization of your debt within a three to five year period of time. You're forced to pay back at least a portion of it. Chapter 7, your consumer debt is wiped clean. But in both instances, Certain things cannot go into bankruptcy or are very, very difficult to get in. The first one, arrears taxes, arrears student loans, court judgments, arrears child support, and you can't file a chapter seven bankruptcy within 10 years of each other. So either way or any of the ways, you know, there's, always hope. There's always something that you can do. And even with the bankruptcy, guess what? The vultures are going to come out of the woodworks sending you offers for credit the next day because they know you can't file bankruptcy again for a long time. What I usually suggest again is local credit union secured credit card to restart. If you actually can pull your score back up, after that two year time period, and you've got the net worth, you actually could buy a home two years out of bankruptcy. The thing is, nothing is for forever. It's always a picture in time. And what you do about what's out there counts. You are the CEO of your own corporation. That corporation's you. So, your financial affairs are important. 